first 10 seconds of silence I've ever heard at the Free Market Foundation. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you Wayne Dubenaga, who's going to be speaking to us tonight generally on, or, or on the OTA experience and so on. Um, Wayne spent most of his working life at Avis, uh, where he was CEO from 2007 to 2012. And during that period, I know that he, 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 Avis received a number of awards, in, in no, no doubt due to his ex excellent uh, control of, the, of, of Avis. Um, some of us knew him then. I knew of him. I didn't know him well. But uh, he's now much more well known for when he started chairing the opposition to Urban Tolling Alliance, OTA, which was Mark I of OTA. It's an initiative uh, that started in, two, in March 2012, and within six months, Wayne then decided to leave the corporate world in order to provide the necessary attention required for the development of OTA. He then revised its funding model late in 2015, and OTA formally changed its name to the Organization for Undoing Tax Abuse, which is what it's now known as, and probably what you all know it as now. It expanded its mandate to tackle broader issues relating to the public sector mal mal maladministration, corruption, and in general, the abuse of, author abuse of authority. Uh, I'm surprised you haven't solved it yet. You've been at it for three years. Grand, it's <laughs> not. Ota's growing team of investigators, researchers, communications, legal personnel have begun to tackle issues in, in, in other state control entities such as ESCOM, SAA, and so on. I was very lucky that I, I phoned up uh, Ota about a month ago because I had to give a presentation to a nurse to, nurse to argue that ESCOM shouldn't get any more money, and I needed a bit of a, an overview of what the story was. And I, was, I went, to, uh, went to, uh, uh, to OTA and met with a person responsible for energy, uh, whose name is Ronald Chokey, uh, and I was absolutely delighted because I'd met him four, four or five years ago, forgotten that he knew such a lot. Of those, in those days, he was with NERSA. He is undoubtedly the best possible person on energy to have in OTA, and I spent two or three hours with him, which made my presentation <coughs> much more easy at a later stage. So you can understand that OTA has got really, really good guys working for them. Uh, Wayne uh, is from KZN, and he got a BSc graduate uh, at University of Natal. Um, he then uh, says that he is a speaker, which we'll hear tonight, a writer, and a civil interventionist. That is for sure something we are aware of. As the CEO of, of, of OTA, he says, I believe it is every citizen's right and duty to challenge the state and its various entities on irrational policy and unacceptable conduct by those in authority who misuse the country's ta taxes. And on his CV, he's got a lovely quote that's by somebody I don't know, Tyree Scott, but he says, it's generally problematic to leave the people who created the problem in charge of finding the solution. <laughs> Wayne will be talking about OTA's journey, its close calls with near closure and other challenges <coughs> that required surmounting to achieve its broader mandate and the road it, current, it is currently on. The talk will also provide a high level exposure of the modus operandi of state capture with SOEs. Wayne, thank you very much. Please come. Thank you. Uh, very much, Terry, and uh, to the Free Market Foundation, Leon, and to your team for the invitation to be here tonight. Um, so the journey I'll take you on is going to set a bit of the scene as to how OUTA became what it is. Uh, it certainly wasn't, uh, we didn't intend to be where we are today. But I think it's about taking opportunities and getting through the difficult patches. Um, and then the, the number of the slides that I'll show you uh, give the picture of of the manipulation of assets, uh, balance sheets, and so forth, in order to raise funds in state and institutions of the modus operandi that we believe is very uh, real. So the question that we ask ourselves, and I certainly ask myself now, is, and was asking right when we set out up, is who, who does take up this challenge when government gets it wrong? And they get it wrong, and they get it so badly wrong. And uh, as uh, 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 one of the uh, people on, on Savrala, the Vehicle Renting and Leasing Association, at the time in, 2012, in 2012, I think it was, Paul Pound was also there, he was the chairman and uh, he's the director of ARTA as well. <clears throat> we were asking this question, 
And uh, as, a, as a business association, we felt we had, had to take a stand on something that was fundamentally flawed after a year of engaging and trying to find a solution with government uh, to suit our industry. And initially it was a selfish approach, it was an industry approach. Uh, and then we started to unpack the impact it was going to have on society. But let's just go back a decade uh, 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 from here, 2008. <clears throat> We were, the world was going through a financial crisis. And uh, we did a, a pretty good job in South Africa. Our banks and our regulations and the laws had, had not allowed the banks to go into the reckless uh, lending uh, uh, processes that were unfolding around the world. And, and we did, we staved off the storm. We didn't feel that impact as much as uh, 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 Europe did, uh, America. And I remember in some of our conferences overseas, they were quite taken aback at our regulations and, and how we'd manage that. Um, we were preparing for the 2010 World Cup. We were building stadiums, we were widening our freeways, uh, and it was a really a good place to be in South Africa. Cast your mind back as we were leading up to World Cup uh, 2010. <clears throat> um, we had our problems, sure, but this was the place to be, this was the place to invest, and there was unity in, in our diversity. We were going places. and. Uh, and, and the World Cup came, and, and it was, was quite exciting. We were set for really big things. <clears throat> Problem is, how did we get here just 10 years later? Think of where we were and where we are. Our SOEs are bankrupt. Literally every single one of them should be in business rescue. The police corruption, the health sector is collapsing. The, uh, our our, our, our um, municipalities are dysfunctional, grossly dysfunctional. I just came back yesterday from Infoleni. It's collapsed. Our education is in, in, in one of the worst in Africa. Um, so we are, we are stagnant. We have growing unemployment uh, and, and we have serious problems. Why? Well, it's a, it's a sad situation, but <clears throat> I, I certainly believe that we haven't done enough as society. We haven't done, done enough as business to challenge the status quo for so long and it's got so bad now that it's almost difficult to undo. And we've got a lot more work to do now as a result of that. So let's go back um, to when Arta started. And this journey that we're on has helped us to, to develop a mindset and a thinking that if we don't do something and we don't develop uh, um, civil interventionist movements and organizations that take the issues and the problems that we have seriously, then we're going to really fail as a nation. And we have an opportunity to get out of it, but we've, uh, we've got to take it seriously. So, so for us, it was about the birth of Arta. Um, and then and, and, and I think if you recall back in 2008 is when Sanra started building these roads. And they were the heroes. Uh, the adverts were good. Uh, people loved the fact that we were going to address congestion. <clears throat> um, but it was only in 2010 that we learned of this, what we call an irrational and illegal plan. Um, called eTolls. Now, the technology works around the world. There's nothing wrong with it. Um, it is in the context of the environment that you try and put this type of technology in that uh, is when it fails. And what we tried to do after learning that, um, that these gantries, uh, after they'd gone up for the first time, we had learned as a car rental industry, the biggest uh, private buyers of cars, biggest fleets in the country, the uh, retail uh, motor industry, the uh, Road Freight Association, I, I, nobody knew that this, these wider roads that were uh, one extra lane on our freeway network that was being uh, put up for us was going to be tolled. Um, and we were quite surprised, literally surprised to hear about it on the radio when we heard Nazir Ali speaking uh, to John Robbie. I remember getting to work and being, I just couldn't believe what I was hearing that, you know, we built these nice roads for you, was the conversation he had, <clears throat> and we want you to pay for them. And, but we, obviously we don't want you to stop at booms. I mean, that'll cause chaos in the traffic. So we've, we've got this lovely new technology. It's to you know, drive now and pay later. Just go under these gantries. But in order to pay, you've got to go and <clears throat> go to a shop, buy a tag, fit your tag onto the windscreen, link your tag with your number plate, go into the internet or go into one of our stores, and log in and set it all up and put money in our account. Just put money. Every time you go into this gantry, it's going to beep. It's going to take three rand off your, off your uh, roughly three rand off your account and keep your account. 
in the black life. That was it. And I thought, really? <clears throat> Phone Paul, got hold of our industry colleagues, said, am I missing something? Did you guys hear about this? And so we, we uh, phoned Sanral and said, look, <clears throat> we need to meet. And for the next year, a whole year, we engaged trying to find a solution. Because our industry needs this information live. People clone our number plates. The dispute resolution mechanism wasn't understood, was cumbersome. They couldn't give us the information live. So if a tourist flew out of Joburg International three minutes early, had gone under a gantry. You know, we had to record the stuff. We had to charge him there and then. They couldn't give us that information. Uh, and so we started to unpack and realize that this was going to fail. <clears throat> we, did quick, uh, uh, we did a lot of research then with the University of Pretoria, Aaron Klazar, who's one of our research managers now. And uh, <clears throat> she um, uncovered the fact that e-tolling works and our research and the paper we put together works in environments where you have a buy-in. You have to have a buy-in from the public. And there was no buy-in here. You have to have administrative systems and, and, and connectivity and integration with vehicle licensing systems like you cannot believe. Smooth, state-of-the-art stuff. Well, 50% of e is incorrect. You have to have <coughs> um, a compliance society. And the more we saw, the more we realized it was going to fail. And it was failing in Portugal. It was failing in Texas. Didn't even get off the ground in Manchester and Edinburgh. But it worked well in London. It worked well in Stockholm. And it worked well because those mayors did a blimmin' good job <coughs> in engaging with society. And involving society in the congestion solutions for their cities. And that's how you do it. Because it's not about wide roads. It's about public transport. And, the, and we were robbed of the opportunity to do what they did well in London and Stockholm. <clears throat> and so society had only a couple of options. They had to, they had to protest. Now, this is, th this is new for us. We don't protest. In the middle class on motorists, they don't protest. But the unions protest. The taxi drivers protest. They block the freeways. This is frustrating for us in this business. And we sat there saying, well, what are we going to do? <clears throat> um, and, uh, and we had to contemplate, but, but what you did start seeing is middle-class society taking to the bridges and starting to demonstrate. And we saw big uh, uh, outcry and, uh, against Zuma last year, April the 7th, where 200,000 people around the country protested. And, uh, and so there was this birth of a society that was tired of taking orders from, from its uh, government, was tired of seeing headlines like Nkandla, and, uh, and other matters. <clears throat> and so I guess we were born at the right time and on a, and on a matter that was quite easy to, to get the public to participate. Because it's a tax that <clears throat> is difficult to collect. So it's not like your plastic bag tax or your fuel tax. If you don't want to pay your fuel tax, the, the fuel attendant just doesn't fill your car up. If you don't want to pay that or... They don't sell you the product. You don't want to pay your plastic bag tax, you bring your own bags. But this was one where people could continue to drive. <clears throat> and the question was, how could we get them to stay strong and become civilly disobedient? And civil disobedience is foreign. It's foreign to us. In our new democratically elected society where the laws, and generally speaking up until now, up until then, country was being run in an okay fashion. But the timing was right and things were going wrong because now we were three, four years into state capture. State capture became a known word a little bit after that. So we decided um, we're not going to protest. The law has been broken, the constitutional rights of proper engagement. And by the way, Sanral said they did engage. They ticked the box. They said uh, they, they put one advert in six newspapers. They hid that advert in the business section some of them in the international business section. <clears throat> and they got 28 responses. 28 responses from three and a half million motorists. And, uh, and they said that uh, the scheme was well accepted by the public. That was their response. <clears throat> um, and we learned how flawed that was. And it was such a vague uh, advert and you couldn't, couldn't make head or tail. And that's why they got no. But they didn't meaningfully engage in the way they should have. And so the public outcry started. Um, we decided that we would 
hold them to account through the courts. Their arrogant attitude was you can go to courts. We are not going to give in. And uh, if the car rental industry, and we had got the car rental industry to stand together and say we are not going to tag up. And we're going to lead a charge <coughs> that, um, that we believed would cripple the system. So the first thing was to go to court and interdict, in urgent interdict, because they were going to launch on the 30th of April. And uh, Praveen Gordon, and this is in 2012, had said in the budget speech, look, we dropped the rate again. By now they dropped it three times from 60 cents. It was now down to 30 cents. So the, 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 the Catholic Church came on board with us and, went, and we went, had an engagement with Sandra and said, well, what were you going to do with the other 30 cents if we had capitulated in the beginning at 60 cents? <clears throat> you know, how is this suddenly still workable at 30 cents? And, um, and so uh, we, we went to court, put a hasty case together, uh, Paul, Mark Corcoran, and, and, and myself, but a good junior a counsel in the name of Adrian Dolavera worked flat out for literally seven days a week. And uh, a great case. And, and William Prince Lou felt it was a great case, great enough to interdict. So literally, Sanral, we're going to start tolling on the Monday. The court, uh, the judge opened the court on a Saturday, a very really rare occasion, to give the announcement that ETOLs will not launch. Now, that was, uh, it was quite a euphoric moment for us. It was nice because we hadn't tagged up and, uh, and the industry wasn't ready, but neither was Sanra. <coughs> They'd missed four launches. And, and what had happened um, was this became international news. We were interviewed by BBC, Al Jazeera, and we couldn't understand why, but but it was the sign of a, a healthy democracy. It was the sign of civil society standing up and challenging government and winning. <clears throat> and Sanral got a fright. Government got a fright. And, uh, and ETOLs couldn't launch. So there was a breathing space for us. And we relaxed a little bit. Only to find over the next eight months or so, <clears throat> government's attrition through lawfare strategy kicked in. And this is what happens with civil society, is that it doesn't have the funds to fight government. And government will wear you down. They will wear you down. They turned our one case into four court cases, took it to the constitutional courts, over, uh, courts overturned the interdict back into the part B of the application. We lost that with a bad judgment. Of course, we'll say it's bad, but it was so bad that when we went to Supreme Court, the Supreme Court did reverse the judgment partially. <clears throat> but what had happened is the money had been borrowed, Bonds were there, and the roads had been built. It was very difficult and complicated for the courts to undo that decision. And so they said to Sanral, you can toll. Um, but if anybody raises a collateral challenge or defensive challenge, for whatever reason, that could scupper the system. So they opened the door for us to stay alive. <clears throat> now, leading up until that, that period, business had left us in the lurch. We were funded by business. We were businessmen taking a business case uh, on here. But the Politburo, who sits on the boards of big business, lent heavily on those boards. And the Barlow Wills, the Imperial Groups, the Bidvests, and the mail started coming through straight after the one case. And uh, literally within a week, every one of our supporters pulled out of this case and left Paul and myself and, uh, and, 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 uh, and one of our other directors, Mike Tatelius, in the lurch <clears throat> with a bill, a uh, three million rand bill, outstanding to the, uh, to the lawyers. And by, the lawyer, by the way, the lawyers told us this case would cost us no more than a million rand, maybe two. Well, we hadn't even got out the interdict and we had three million. <laughs> Another four court cases later, 10 million rand, folks. <clears throat> so we were against the wall and we were told, close down. Close this organization down. You have no assets. You haven't been trading recklessly. Uh, just, you know, get out of this case. And we had to make a fundamental decision. And we said no, because if we do that, government becomes the beneficiaries of a very deceitful and very bad campaign. It was not good for this country. And why we were challenging this is not because we didn't like Sanral. They, they built good roads with good engineers. Or that we didn't uh, agree with the technology. But what we could see was that it was going to fail to the extent that government would be happy if it got 60 or 70 percent compliance. It would be happy. That's what we felt, and that's the feedback we got. But you cannot run user-pay schemes where 20 or 30% of people don't pay because those who are paying get a bit irritated with that fact, and they cannot go and collect the money from the 20 to 30%, as we saw in Portugal and Texas. 
And the 70% that do pay starts to spiral downwards, becomes 68. And, and so these schemes collapse over time. And we don't want that because what we didn't want was government to suffer this crisis of legitimacy that it cannot enforce its own laws. And they shouldn't be doing that. And we're having it right now. Today we had a conference with stakeholders in R2. They are trying to force, and they believe government has this view that if it legislates something, the law is there, the people will follow. But if you cannot administer the law, um, then the problems start. And that's, that's going to happen now with R2 and traffic fines. And then that's going to flow over into vehicle licenses. And it gets messy. So we didn't want that. And we still don't want that. So... <clears throat> So 18 months later, 10 million rand really is where we are. We got to, went to the Supreme Court. And it was at that time when we had to go to the Supreme Court that our lawyers found us and said, look, we've got to file. We've got a week. We've got a week to file towards, uh, the, um, I think it was early, early 2013, to go to the Supreme Court. Um, and you guys owe us 3 million. And that's going to be another million. And they said, uh, look, we'll deal with the 3 million, but you have to put a million rand in our bank account. This week now, if we're going to file in the Supreme Court, <clears throat> what do we do? Again, we were told, close down. Just, just go away. This is our own advisory board. So we uh, said, no, we've got, to, we've got one more shot at this. We're going to go to the public. Business were running scared. They, they, they didn't want to cross swords with government. <clears throat> so we decided to call a press conference, and we literally said to the media, you tell the public out there, they've got one week to put a million rand in our account. Otherwise, we are closing out and down. We had no choice then. But let's try and get the money from the public. Well, we got three million rand in 48 hours, <coughs> which was lovely. <laughs> but it was uh, one million of that came from the DA, and it was just before the elections. It was a good political uh, <coughs> ploy. In hindsight, I don't think we should have accepted it. But when your back's against the wall and you've got that much money outstanding, you take it. We said, look, if the ANC want to give us as well, we'll take it. <laughs> um, so, um, so we breathed a sigh of relief, literally settled some of the debt, went there, got that ruling, uh, and that's it. We closed the court case. We didn't get exactly what we wanted, but we got enough to say, right, now bring it on, Sanra. We're not paying. <clears throat> got Zwillinzi, Mavavi, myself, a number of us, and said, look, you're going ahead, but we're telling you now we're not paying. So we want you and we're inviting you to arrest us now because we're going to break your law. And they, of course, they refused to do that um, <clears throat> and they couldn't. So we started the campaign. Break the law. Do not pay your ETA. And what we saw was, um, was uh, uh, the public saying, fine, we'll play this game with you. This is lacquer. I mean, we're quite enjoying it. It was uh, the social media platforms that we were setting up, the websites. And it was incredible to feel the energy, but a lot of anxiety. And the public was saying, will you defend us? Well, I said, well you know, <laughs> with what? <laughs> How? You know, this, we've learned now litigation is costly. <clears throat> and so we, um, we then went into this transformation phase to, to try and find something that would work, a model that we could defend. And when we said we'd defend the first case, we took a chance, but nothing happened because everybody said, well, that's fine. You know, I meet one, in th one, uh, one in three million, I don't think I'm going to get uh, uh, the first case. So, <clears throat> and Arta will defend it, so let's see what happens. Um, and what we did do was decided to change that. And we said to the public, we'll defend everybody who's summonsed, so long as we've got money in the bank. And people say, well, how, how do we help? How do we contribute? And we set it all up in a way that, um, and we'd learned from our previous escapades that we should not allow one-off donations. One-off donations is not going to fund an organization that needs to go on a new journey. So we, we put in a place a debit order process, and it needs to be a monthly. We cannot pay salaries. We cannot do a lot of things on one-off donations. Because what we had to do, if we were going to defend anybody that got a summons, we had to build our own legal team. And that's the journey we set out on. <clears throat> and so um, in 2016, uh, we became the organization Undoing Tax Abuse. And the reason for that is that we had been um, asked by many people to go beyond ETOLs. And we needed to start challenging 
um, corruption and maladministration in government. We had built up a brand, we had built up a following, and the people were starting to come on board. So we said, fund us, we will do two things. We'll challenge as much as we can in the space of tax abuse, and we'll defend everybody who gets a summons <coughs> that, that helps us. And, uh, and, and so this growth pattern started, and the money started coming in. And, uh, and we had five directors. We brought in two new directors who'd helped us get through some of the impasses that we couldn't really see on the funding models, on making sure we got the debit order scheme right. <clears throat> and to build a legal team, we employed an, a, a, an, audit, uh, a, an advocate and one lawyer. And we had a very, very strong case because by now the Western Cape had won their case against uh, Sanro in all three courts, exactly the same argument as ours. The only difference is they hadn't built the roads. <clears throat> and those arguments had played out already in that court case, and they're going to play out in a constitutional battle here. So Sanral have been issuing summonses for two years now. We have got 700 people, f files that we are handling. <clears throat> They've issued 30,000 summonses out there. Two years, not one case in court yet. Why is that? Well, they've acknowledged ETOLS has failed. 20% compliance. 80% of people don't pay. Uh, about 60 million rand a month has been collected. They need 300 million rand a month. They're barely paying for the collection process. And uh, what you have now <coughs> is a scheme that has collapsed, elections coming up, and I guess this is a timing game. This is a situation of they lost 9% of their votes, from 63 to 54% just before... Uh, they switched on tolls in 2014 at those elections. <coughs> and they're going to have to use the pulling of the plug of e-tolls as a political decision by the new ANC or the new guard to try and hold on to Gauteng. So it's not being announced now. It'll be announced then. And if it isn't announced then, it still failed. The scheme has failed, but both uh, uh, Bladen Zimandi, um, uh, David Makura, all of them have said we have to find a solution. And the solution is there. It is the fuel levy. They've already collected all the money they need. If they had have listened to us in the beginning, a 10 cent fuel levy back then would have been dropped now by 10 cents. The whole bond would have been paid off and uh, everything would have gone away. Instead, they've got a 20 billion rand bond still outstanding, 11 billion rand in, in debt to them from the motorists, and, uh, and they can't get the money. So why not go the route of the fuel levy, <clears throat> which is a user pay scheme with zero admin costs, zero while the ETOL system costs a billion rand a year to administer before one rand goes into tarmac. And at that stage, the fuel levy was around one rand 11 cents. It's now three rand 16 cents. We asked them to increase it just by nine cents for the Gauteng Freeway project. A national fuel levy. I kept saying, but why should people in PE and East London pay for Gauteng's roads? Well, who's paying for their freeways? You know, this is the economic hub. If we need eight lane highways, give them to us because we feed this whole country. So this is not about these are Gauteng's roads, they're South Africa's roads. <coughs> so we came close. We were against the wall. We, we came very close to collapse a number of times. But it was this new journey that we said, let's go on a journey and build a team. And the things we had to do were three fundamental changes. We had to get our funding model right. We had to have money because civil society doesn't operate well on volunteers. It doesn't. You cannot have a situation of here today, gone tomorrow. And volunteers move on. They get jobs. Um, it's also hard to manage volunteers when they are here and they're not here. <clears throat> it's also hard to get the right caliber of people who are relying on volunteers. So we decided to pay market-related salaries, get the best people. To do that, you've got to pay them salaries. You've got to have offices, you've got to have rent, and you've got to pay monthly. So do not allow people to donate to you once off. Make it extremely difficult. So we took off our bank details of the site. We put in an electronic <coughs> process and we said, if you want to donate to Arta, you need to give us a debit order. You need to pay us monthly. So rather than give us a thousand rand a month, a year, or two thousand rand once off, give us a hundred rand a month. Give us eighty rand a month. Give us whatever you feel. But please do not give us a once off because it's hard. It's hard to pay salaries once off. It's hard to go to your landlord and say, we're just going to pay you rent once a year. <clears throat> it doesn't work like that. And that was a fundamental change. And so what we've become is a crowdfunded civil society 
organization. We're funded by the people. And why this now works is that we don't have to be relevant to business anymore. We have to be relevant to the real people that we mean something to. And that is the people of this country. The people are the ones who are frustrated. And it's small and medium-sized business that gives us a lot as well. These are the guys that are invested in this country. They cannot move south. They cannot go to Australia. They've got their buildings. Their lives are here. And they want this country to work. So they want us to be successful. So as we broadened our mandate to start tackling other matters, <clears throat> so it happened. And, uh, and this was the other thing that we had to do. We're not going to make lawyers rich. Of course we have to engage with the law firm and se senior counsel. But we were going to be able to build cases fast and cheap. Today we have one advocate and seven lawyers full-time in our legal department. We have gone from the three people who started this organization when we interdicted it to 48 staff now. That's, uh, that photo was taken a few months ago. And, uh, and it's an incredible organization. It is set up in a functional structure. We do project management. We have portfolio managers. <clears throat> Uh, and these are the specialists, uh, uh, like as Terry was saying, in, um, in, in uh, energy, transport, water, health, and so forth. Um, education. We mirror the, try and mirror the departments. And then we prop these people up because they're specialists. They can handle TV, radio, debates. Um, they do multiple projects. And they're supported by functional teams. Legal, investigations, research, and communications. Comms is important. It is so critical, this, because you have to tell the media quickly what you're doing. You have to respond to breaking stories in the space that you're operating. And I remember when I was still at Avis, uh, uh, as we had interdicted and, 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 and working with Paul late into the nights and the media were phoning us. Because headline, every time the media put etols into a, a, a front page of their newspaper, they sold millions of newspapers because it was just emotional stuff. And so when Sanrod said something on Etolls, the papers published it, but they won our response. I remember going into a board meeting one day and, and the, and, and, and the uh, journalist said, we need your responses. I said, yeah, I'll give it to you tonight, but let me just finish this board meeting, I'll get home. And I said, no, we're going to print, four o'clock, we want your response now or you won't get your side of the story. And the media was our only voice piece. You know, we didn't have any other ways to get our response out there. And the public were waiting for what we were going to do and what we were going to say. So we had to become relevant to the media. And that's why our comms department now, we respond within an hour of a breaking story uh, on matters that we are working on. And then this is underpinned by marketing. And what we've done is brought a business management style to civil interventionist uh, organization. We've got finance, the HR, IT, organization development. And we've gone from this three-man team to this 48-person team. <clears throat> seven lawyers, investigation team of five investigators, uh, seven, uh, six people in research, <clears throat> and a comms team. Doing memes, doing little productions, quick little videos, uh, and, and so forth. And I must say, it's exciting um, going from those three to five directors. But we had to transform further. We had to get our governance right. Going from five people in two and a half years to that, has been massively challenging. It's been a stretch like you cannot believe. I thought, uh, you know, operating and managing a 2,000-person uh, organization out of uh, Avis was tough. This is the most toughest space because you can imagine going to 40 people, putting a new structure, moving a comms and marketing person into, trying to move them into a growing organization, and they're not able to grow, creates frustration. In fact, in 2016, that functional structure was resisted by two directors. They wanted to keep it completely flat with, 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 with no accountability. We uh, had to go away for two days and, 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 and uh, with a facilitator to find a solution to our new system. And, we, and two directors had to leave uh, because we had to take a vote on it. It was stressful stuff. Last year, we had to fire a director. Starts a smear campaign against us. So this has been the most stressful period of my life, I can assure you. Uh, but it's been the most fun. It's been the most exciting. Um, and so we've gone from those five white male directors uh, just two years ago to uh, the beginning of this year, to April. And now Makosi Kosa just joined us at the beginning of this month. So we have now a team uh, of non-exec directors and, 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 uh, 
and executive directors that will become more non-execs in the next uh, couple of months. Um, we have transformed from <coughs> five white males to to uh, 27 percent um, white and and, f and 55 percent female. That's not about white and, and black, but it's about transforming. It's about bringing in new thinking. It's about bringing in new expertise. <coughs> and and essentially, what's happened in the tale of our last uh, six years of art has been told in three in two three year periods. The first three years of our life was this, 10 million rand on one project, ETOLs, 99% of that money spent on lawyers. A little bit on five volunteers and some operating costs. The next three years, 70 million rand. Average of 21 staff, 5 to 40. 30 million rand paid in salaries, operations costs, rent, computers. And this is the big difference the litigation war chest, the provision <coughs> and the actual spend. Because now we can go to war with government. We realize that if we're going to build cases and be effective as a civil intervention unit, gone are the days of headlines, gone are the days of threatening and not doing anything. Because this is what government likes about NGOs, most of them. It is about you raise an issue you raise a concern, and they say, yes, we hear you, good point, no problem. And three months later, they've ignored you. They've moved on. They've ignored your issue. It's a headline. It's gone. <clears throat> they just keep going. You have to hold them to account. And the only way you can do that is to put them in jail or at least go through the process that gets you there. You can only go so far. The NPA has to do their work. And so for the next the last period of this area, we've gone up to 78 projects in, that, in the two and a half years. And those were laying charges against ministers, deputy ministers, uh, um, state-owned institutions, the Anush Singhs, the Brian Walefis, Ben and Gabani's, uh, um, Zwane. Uh, the list is long, Faith Mutambi. Now, people say, why are you wasting your time? <coughs> well, if you don't lay the charges, there's nothing that can happen anyway. If you have the energy and you have the team, do it. And the reason you do it is because who's in power today is not in power tomorrow. And we've seen that happening already. <clears throat> so the charges that we've laid are absolutely voluminous with all the facts. Police can literally take those charges, check the facts, and go and arrest those people. But they haven't. Now we know why. State capture put the barriers there, but those are coming down. And if we want to now start laying charges against these people who transgressed two years ago, you want to try and do it now or next year? Well, it's a witch hunt. It's too late. You've lost the evidence. The whistleblowers are gone. It's a, it's a case that has no standing. <clears throat> and so this is what we do. And if the rule of law takes its course, all those cases, every one of those people will be in jail without a doubt. This is the dilemma that, uh, that Cyril faces now. You know, how do you go? And he's playing a very tough game, a tough uh, a situation. He's hamstrung because if the rule of law took its course and we laid all the charges that we have to, and not even talking local government where we already started to operate, <clears throat> I reckon about 50 to 70 percent of the ruling party leadership has got a problem. So, we've learned a lot. We've had some extre extremely exciting learning. So this is the last three years, and now we're going into challenging local government. Why? Well, I don't have to tell you, but if you think it's bad and national, uh, we've, as I said, we're in Infraleni, we're in, in Governor Beck, we're out of Ditcher Butler. They're collapsing. 33% of our towns are collapsing. This is where we live. This is where we drink water, this is where we go to school, this is where we die, we're buried in cemeteries in local municipalities, as Makosi Koza reminds us. <clears throat> and she's been an incredibly uh, great addition to our team, and she's passionate about the stuff, and she's studied it, and she's got her master's in it. So our learning is that in the four institutions that keep people motivated and keep people and, and nations prosperous, um, you obviously have the main player, government, and you have a big player with government called business. But it's the oversight and the driving of the energy and the story and getting the people to understand what's really happening that comes from mainly media, but now more so 
from civil society. And civil society has this waxing and waning uh, 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 lifestyle and, uh, uh, or, or life length in, in, in countries around the world, in, organ in, in societies around the world. <clears throat> and, and the sad thing is that when everything gets, gets right, they go, they disappear. And then they have to come back when it gets, uh, goes wrong. And we've got to try and get this civil interventionist organizations to remain the oversight bodies now and not rely on government to do that. Because if you do, uh, they take advantage of the situation. So trust <clears throat> is the defining principle. And if we don't get the trust of those institutions right, um, then you have the uncertainty and you have the lack of growth. And you have the instability and decline and decay. And that's exactly what has happened here. And that will continue to happen. And the four institutions are, if you've seen the uh, Edelman uh, uh, Trust Barometer, um, 2008. It's very interesting stuff. They've been measuring the stuff through those four institutions. And it's low internationally. <clears throat> um, uh, this is what it is. In 28 countries, it's less than half. I think we got to half here. Yeah. But if you look at it, you'll see the East. You see China, you'll see Indonesia, India, rapidly growing. Of course, off a blow base. Of course, the people love the governments when they start moving into systems that start working and, and enrichment and prosperity improves. But the trust factor of society and governments um, in the Western world is low and declining. And if you look at South Africa, um, and we were only measured from this period on, uh, and those four institutions, our trust barometer index was five points behind the rest of the world, and it's now 11 points behind. <clears throat> and government has the lowest trust in a government in this world is in South Africa. <clears throat> 15, and it's going backwards. I mean, it's so low, but it's still going backwards. But this is the sad reality. Media, business, and NGOs from 45 to 35, business de declining. Why is that? <clears throat> Well, they will tell you that um, uh, the business element is, this is the percentage of people that say CEOs should be taking a stronger stand and leading government policy making, engaging more, putting their, their foot down and not waiting for government uh, uh, to impose what's best for society. This is exactly what uh, Savrala was doing. This is what business was doing until business ran away <coughs> from its responsibility. And... Uh, and 60%, they will tell you, the public will tell you, that they believe. This is a belief. This is, a, this is a, the research of views that 60% are not driven by doing what's right, but by what's good for their organization and their bonuses and their profits. <coughs> and I'm afraid that's a, that's a sad reality. And so you start seeing the other side of the coin. <coughs> you start seeing... This is sad. I mean, I feel for these guys. We've, uh, we've met with them. We've spoken to them. They've come out from the UK. But the simple reality is they allowed SARS um, to bring themselves in and to be used. They put 23 people onto this case, 25, uh, 30 people, 13 months they worked. They got paid 23 million. And they missed the ethical step of interviewing the damn people who were implicated. They didn't interview Ivan <laughs> Pile or Van Lochenberg. They didn't even interview them. How do you do that? The law is clear. The ethics and the codes of this industry are clear. <clears throat> wow. And then you get the McKinsey's, and then you get the Steinoffs and the multi-choices. And so the list starts to go on, and we've got to ask ourselves, what is business doing? Why is business allowing this to happen? And so we need a new normal in the whole space of, because we've lost trust in auditors. I don't trust an audit report now. What, we've got to look deeper. So let's have a look <coughs> at some of the things that we've looked at on state capture. You must know this is a very well planned uh, plundering of the public's purse. It is, it is not a mistake. This is well orchestrated. It has got people on the inside in government, Zuma and his henchmen, and people on the outside, the Guptas, who put the tenders in. And they needed to create a very attractive funding landscape. And so what they did, <coughs> And they also needed to sorry, silence the enforcement agencies, which is the captured uh, NPA and Hawks. But they also needed to encourage business to not get involved in this. And that comes from policy. That comes from procurement. That comes from tenders. That comes from, do you want to play in the space of big government spending? Then don't complain. 
and businesses looked away and they knew they shouldn't have. And this is the playing fields and many more. Now, why is the playing fields? Well, this is where the big investment takes place. And so I want to show you a few graphs of balance sheets going back a decade. And this is how you paint the picture. And this is how you see the modus operandi of state capture. So Sandwell's accounting standards, um, they apply the accounting standards 16 <coughs> to property, plant and equipment. It allows for valuation of assets and uh, depreciated replacement costs. That's fine. I mean, this is not unlawful. But there's an ethical question here. When state and entities start revaluing their assets excessively, and you ask yourself, well, who, who are you going to sell the roads to? Who are you selling our power stations to? Are you trading in these assets? Because if they're not tradable assets, what are you doing? And what they were doing was setting the scene to the lending houses who became part of the problem. So we ask, you know, you start asking these questions, what parameters, who does your evaluations of your roads? Um, uh, uh, there has been collusion in the construction industry. What is the real cost of road construction in South Africa? Our research shows that the Gauteng Freeway project shouldn't have cost anything more than $9 billion. We paid $18 billion. And while we know that there's corruption, while we know it, and we've gone, this is the other sad thing as we go to the oversight entities, the industry bodies for engineers and that. And when we approached them right in the beginning, they, they, they ran away from us. They didn't want to help us because Sanral's a big client. That was their words to us. <clears throat> but so we've taken the information back to them and said, here it is. There's two, there were 15 work packages on the Gauteng Freeway Improvement Project. 15. And you break them down and you say, there's work package A, there's work package F. I think it's those two. Might be two other ones. But 10 kilometers each. This one had a little bit more interchange work. That one had a little bit more bridge work. So we took out the bridge work and the interchange work and we just compared the 10 kilometers of four lanes. One new lane and three other lanes resurface. Same methodology, same uh, building construction uh, processes of, of various uh, um, engineering practices uh, in making sure that the ultra-thin concrete processes were, they were exactly the same. And the one cost twice as much as the other. Twice as much per kilometre, per square metre on a unit basis. Why? Well, that company is connected to Mr. Zuma, Italian company, which was part of the company that was building the Angula power plant, which went from 8.9 billion to 30. This is the corruption that's happening. And so what happens is when you inside and you and start to earn money on the outside and, and they're connected, uh, that the tenders are awarded in, in a way, and it's very easy to do. <clears throat> so you start sucking money out the system. And, uh, and this is what happens. This is what the balance sheet starts to look like. So I'm just going to show you, first of all, to 2009. This is when Zuma uh, came in. Uh, you have uh, 2004. But there's a bit of an illiquid organization here because you have the total assets slightly below the liabilities. But it's a state-owned organization. They've depreciated their roads. They've got some toll roads. And that's undervalued. I understand that. That's not the value, 7 billion rand of our roads. But what do you want to do here? Do you want to value for the sake of valuing to borrow? Well, that's exactly what happens. And so in 2008 to 2009, they revalued their assets and their liabilities went up through borrowing. So you see the pattern starts to develop. 145% revaluation of assets from uh, now <coughs> close to um, 12 billion uh, to, to 30 billion, so 18 billion rand increase. So you say, okay. You valued your assets, right? And IFRS allows you to do that. Well done. So what happens next? Well, that graph now moves to the left because you can see what's coming. <clears throat> the valuation goes up again by 780%. 256 billion now. Well, what? didn't you value correctly there? The same length of road, 16,000 kilometers. The length of road hasn't climbed, but that's climbed. Why? Now, why, where's the Auditor General? Where are the finance people? What is going on? Don't, didn't you get it right the first time? Now you have to do it again. And then you're going to do it again, another year, by another 19%. The road length is still the same. And then two years later, you do it again. The road length is still the same. This growth in road length, by the way, was handed to them, was roads handed to them by some of the provinces because they just couldn't manage the roads, construction and maintenance. 
But but that's the that's the new length there, and it goes up by another 19 percent. And so you start seeing this picture emerging, and it keeps growing. <clears throat> this is the issue. Now what you have are lending houses who are saying, and Sanral and all the state institutions are saying, we, we need money. Government gives us a tranche, 10 billion rand back here, it's now at 15. But we want to do projects, so PRC and all the lending houses, Future Growth, Stan Lib, all of them are there. <clears throat> and this is where the sin starts, is that if these state and institutions, I'll show you the other graphs, were on the listed on the JSE, they would not have got the money. But because government backed the bonds and gave lovely interest rates, the lending houses said, how much do you want? And they kept giving, and they kept giving until a year or so ago, and they realized that these state-owned institutions are bankrupt and the government bonds are now becoming worthless because the government cannot back those bonds anymore. And they have been lending to state-owned institutions in what I say is an unethical manner. And you'll see how bad it gets. The same thing happens in Transnet. Same graph, same modus operandi. A little bit later, started a couple of years later. And this is how they went in and started to plunder. Make the balance sheet look good so that uh, the, the lending houses can say that's great. And, and guess what? <clears throat> We're not going to give it back to you and pay you back. And the returns of these, which they should do in efficient, uh, efficiently run state-owned institutions, they're going to make sure that the government will back these bonds. And so you and I end up paying either in increased tariffs on electricity or bailouts to SAA, Transnet, Sanral being bailed out, higher tranches. So what's the difference between the debt and the lending? The interest-bearing debt. versus interest-bearing debt. What's the difference? Um, well, there's, there's, there's uh, the other liabilities. This is just the interest-bearing portion of those liabilities. So sorry, that, that's part of this graph. It should be inside it. I'm just showing you the portion that is, uh, that is, uh, that is interest-bearing in, that, in, the li in the total liability. <coughs> That's interesting. Yeah. Same thing in Denel. See the modus operandi. Flat for years and then suddenly increase. But the interesting one is Eskom. <coughs> so look at this uh, 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 assets. So other assets and then the, the property. This is the plant and equipment. Power stations valued at, uh, uh, at about uh, 60 billion. <coughs> Over the years is now just under 600 billion rand. And that's the liabilities that followed suit and that came largely from interest borrowings from the banks. Now, <coughs> you, go, you go to the public in a multi-year price determination to get your money to build your assets. Why are you borrowing? Because you're getting the money from the public and I'll show you how. Uh, they did that. But this is debt they cannot service anymore. So against that backdrop, there's those graphs. So you look at those graphs with the assets and liabilities growing, but the output is this flat. <clears throat> the generation in terawatt hours is lower than it was 10 years ago. Sales, lower than it was in terawatt hours. Coal burn, lower than it was. So here you have an organization, the lending houses are seeing this, and they're saying your performance is flat, you're not growing. But you're revaluing your assets every year on what basis? Existing power plants or is this Madupi and Kusili? So there's a, there's a fundamental problem with this organization, but still right up until this year here and here, <clears throat> the lending houses say, how much do you want? Government backed. Government backed guarantees. 12% uh, uh, interest rate. How much do you want? And then they started to realize. And I've asked them the question because we've presented to the lending house. If this was a JSE listed company with no government backed bonds, would you have given them anything? They said, not a cent. Now that's sick. And those boards of those organizations need to answer. So here we have the new build uh, programs of Eskom. <clears throat> In 2007, Madupi and Kusili benchmarked at 36 billion each. We managed to, or they managed to, Eskom, get the boards to agree that that's what they're going to build those two power stations at. 149, 150 billion, and Gula at, at just under 9 billion. <clears throat> that's in, sin in itself. But let me show you what happened. So there was our electricity price, 2007, 18 cents per kilowatt hour. 
at inflation plus one, we'd be paying about 38 cents now. That's the tariff hikes they got. They went to the multi-year price determination process and they said to government and to NERSA, guys, we need to build these big capital expenditure power plants. And we've got these lovely projections, we're growing as a nation and we're going to need a lot more power. Well, you could say, okay, you could argue that they speculated a bit wrong. They got it horribly wrong because we went flat. But they went to government and said, we need these tariff hikes. And they got them, first five years. And if they had have used the money that they got from the public and the increased tariff hikes, they would have settled those plants. They would have been built on time. And by the year 2013, our price could have gone back to where it should have been with an inflation. They would have settled and paid for the capital expenditure of those 150 billion rand two power plants. We've overpaid by 607 billion rand. And they borrowed another 340 billion rand. I mean, that's crazy. That's crazy. And against that backdrop, <coughs> that's the revenue climbing from 39 billion to 200, uh, 275 billion rand a year. You and I are paying. This is an indirect tax because this state in this institution was plundered. Where did this money go? This is a sin. And now the poor new board have to try and get themselves out of this hole. And it's virtually impossible. And, and they've got a massive problem. And what we're saying to the board, <coughs> all the boards now, is the guys who put you in this position, you have a fiduciary duty to go and arrest them. Your role now is to go after Brian Malefi, Anush Singh, Mark Pemensky, all of those people. Every one of them that created this problem, your duty, your fiduciary duty is to do this job. You've got the contracts, you've got the board minutes. We don't have all this information. We'll, we'll go and subpoena it, we'll go and pay it. You've got it, and now you have to go and put them in jail. And nothing's happened. Nothing has happened. They said work in progress maybe, but it's very slow. So those new build projects have gone from there. To, that was the last price we saw. I think it's about 550 billion, five years behind, and still not finished. Where is this going to go? <clears throat> I mean, this is, this is just madness. But business is doing business with Eskom. The Hitachis of the world hold back on their contracts. Wait, we're not going to tender yet. Chancellor House, do you want to invest? I mean, what are we doing? Why isn't big business standing up and saying, bulldust government? We cannot allow this. They see this stuff. Why do you leave it to us, to civil society, to fight? It's crazy. <clears throat> Just looking at the primary energy exploitation in Eskom, this is what they've paid. Now remember, the energy coal burn, which is coal is the main portion of this, has been declining because energy demand is declining how does a board and a management team allow this to happen this is a commodity the price didn't do that this is about manipulation this is about bringing uh, open gas uh, uh, cycle gas turbines diesel in uh, hairdressers getting contracts um, it's crazy <coughs> it's absolute madness that billions of rands are spent like this our calculation, if Eskom was pr frugal and, 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 and very prudent in their, in their management of coal supplies and the cost plus coals and the investments, with a, again with a CPI plus 1% escalation, that's where the energy burn should have been. 96 billion rand saving just by managing your energy uh, input uh, properly. So that's besides all the other stuff. This is just more. And in the multi-year price determination, now Eskom is going to sue NERSA because they wanted the 19% increase and they only got five. We fought like hell on NERSA's side to give them, ask them for zero. They got five, they want more. And we're saying against this backdrop, are you mad? Now we must go to court with NERSA to help them fight. The problem with NERSA's over the last few years is they've been so inconsistent in their application of their rules in the MYPD They've allowed them to get away with too much. They should have put their foot down long ago. So the new nurse people have a tough job. 
So I think this is, in, in closing, this is, a, this is a question of ethical conduct. And, and what we want from the finance institutions is how did you lend with a conscience? <clears throat> and I said, would they have done so on a JSC as if they were JSC listed? They wouldn't have. Um, and where does the JSC come in on this? These organizations, uh, to trade on them, they're part of the JSC. Why is the JSC doing so? Why isn't the JSC suspending any trading with these state-owned institutions? We're all becoming complicit. We're all looking the other way. We're turning a blind eye. We're too scared to cross swords with government. But we've got no option. This is what happens. So we've allowed this country to get into the mess. So we have to now work hard to prevent more of the same. <clears throat> and knowing what we know now, we've, we've got to challenge these past contracts and the new ones. Sanral is building a road from Sadara down to Durban, Etiquini. I think it's 70... Six seventy-eight kilometers. I don't want to tell you the price. It's just madness. People in the rest of Africa and Europe build roads at half our price. Why? So we've got to challenge these boards. We want the new boards now. We've, we're starting to put them under pressure to take action. <clears throat> they have to hold these past transgressors to account. And our challenge now is to get government to self-correct. Now that is the biggest challenge there is. But I think we can do it. Um, Question is, is big business going to step up to the plan? When I talk big business, these are the guys that pay the VAT, pay the taxes, pay the company tax. They have power. They have power. I'm not talking about a tax revolt. I'm talking about use your muscle, stand up to government. And if government says, well, we don't like the way you're talking to us, you know, we're not sure if we're going to change the regulations to make it less favorable for you to get the rebates you get or the tenders or the procurement processes. Well, business must stand together and say, then where are you going to get it from? What are you going to do about it? Because we're going to stand together on this. You correct this country, you sort this nonsense out, or we actually don't trade with you. And then what does government do? I don't know if they're going to do it. And when are we going to get our trust back in these auditing houses? So in the absence of big business, it, it does become civil society and it does become media that has to play this bigger role. The problem with the media is that they've lost a lot of credibility. They have been publishing stuff that they shouldn't have been. They're relying on social media. Social media is the biggest purveyor of fake news. And so what's rising now are the people that are trustworthy is where you go to to get your news. So when Anton Eberhardt says something on energy, you listen. When the Minister of Energy says something on energy, you doubt it. That's sad that you don't trust your government. And so you find these individuals who become trusted, and they are the best source of news now. And the media houses have got a lot to do to get their house in order. And civil society has to start becoming far more powerful, but it has no ability to do so unless it is funded. Unless it is funded by the public and small business and medium-sized business. And you, I cannot tell you the power of the 100 rand a month from an individual on a monthly basis, because you don't feel that. But when you get tens and tens and tens of thousands of people doing it, and you keep growing that, we grow. So the more we grow, the more we do. Simple as that. We've got a policy, 55% of our revenue that we get goes into people. And if we get an extra 100,000 rand a month, we'll go and employ another two good people <coughs> because we've got to get into other spaces. And, uh, and we keep 35% for litigation so that the people can feel the pain and the other 15% on our operations costs. And if we have to have our full 10 floors of buildings, we're going to do it. That's the journey. That's the dream. We should actually exist. We don't really want to be here, guys. We're entrepreneurs, we're businessmen, we want to go and work in the real economy. But I can tell you that floor of our 45 people are professionals and they're activists. And the energy is high, there's no shortage of work. And the, and, and the positiveness that comes out of fighting corruption is incredible. So where to from here is about rebuilding what our nation requires. And we're starting to hear the right noises coming out of the new <coughs> um, regime or the new the new uh, political elite. We've got to get the right people into public office. Systems, structure, training, ethics, and, and, and local government is, requires extremely urgent attention. And it's not going to be able to be solved 
uh, in the old standard way. So we are reaching out to, to government to, to offer solutions, to bring people out of retirement in those towns, engineers, accountants, <coughs> and let's go and fix them. Um, but again, we, we've got to do that with uh, systems and, and, and good people. So we feel that civil society organizations are, are relevant now more than ever, and, and, and we hope that it stays that way. We've got to uncover that which is wrong and challenge this government. I want to thank you for your time. I know, th I know there's questions. If uh, I'll stand, yes, a couple of questions. Uh, if there are, yeah. I'll just try and direct. I've got one at the back there. Two, three, four, from the usual numbers. I think that uh, most of the people here will agree that without Outer, we would be in a far worse situation. Thank you for that. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> they're short. The oil that was unsold under market value because it needed um, stock rotation when it had been in the ground for billions of rands. Yeah. What's happening with that? I think it's Jermatt Peterson yeah. on Eskom. Yeah. Why don't we just separate off the generation and the generation plants individually as cost centres, which is very successful around the world? and leave it to the competition board, mm. and then nurse and manages the, the grid. Mm. When are you going to stop seeing we're getting these people paid? Mm. And you mentioned a couple of people mm. who we can trust on information. <coughs> Will you put that on your website? Yeah, good idea. Thanks. So, Oilgate, it's a project. It's a pending project for us. There's clear corruption there clear evidence of it. <clears throat> um, we're hoping and we are working behind the scenes with enforcement agencies. Um, and by the way, when we were given the Gupta leaks, it was an amazing journey and, and, and time for us. The, we, the, they literally were, were given to us <clears throat> um, and given to a few organizations. But we had to spend half a million rand stripping that information into a <laughs> an IT system that could read PDFs, uh, 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 so it's strip it onto HTML format with a proper forensic uh, process. <clears throat> and we developed the skill to be able to search and find so much information so quickly that we, uh, that we were taken away with the uh, number of the, uh, a few of the people, the good people inside the enforcement agency. I don't want to mention who, into a remote place in the middle of the country <clears throat> just to study what they could and they still use that information. So the, the, the oil gate matter, we believe it's such an easy one. And because we've got so much on our plate, we've parked it, and there will be a resolution on that. There will be uh, arrests made, and uh, if the, again, if the rule of law takes its course. So again, a parked project out of our 78, we've now got uh, close to 90 projects since, since our, in the last three months. Um, <coughs> this was, that was our last financial year number. So. Um, on the on the matter of so what was the second question? Yes, so so we put a case into the competition commission to do just that. It was actually proposed in Parliament and approved, by the way, some seven years ago, mm -hmm. to do that. And uh, for some reason, Eskom used its muscle to keep it. So we laid a complaint to the competition commission because this is a gross abuse of a monopolistic situation, and. Uh, and, and we are told that through technicalities and through the right space, it's got to be put somewhere else. The reality is that has to happen, and Eskom knows that. Um, but there's, there's a journey to go before they can get that right. The whole IPP, uh, um, Independent Power Producers and Renewable Energies, it's creating a whole new dynamic. I, I think Eskom knows that its shelf life is very short, its financial model is, is extremely uh, precarious and uh, and and inside all of that splitting up Eskom is, is is something that has to happen. But when it's going to happen, I, I don't know why the Competition Commission uh, didn't. They like the argument, but they can't take it much further. Um, the names we'll put on, on 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 our website. I think that's a great idea. And the third one was, oh, uh, yeah. Look, um, it's it's something that. 
we believe we should he shouldn't pay it's not a case we're taking up it's it's like it's just we just got too much we got we got another 52 massive projects to get to when we can and that one we've said the the political parties are putting up a good fight other entities we can't do everything so it'll it'll take its course and small it's minute in the bigger scheme of things <coughs> number two thank you very much indeed Wayne. it's extremely interesting and, and um, eye-opening and a little bit frightening in a way but congratulations on what you do you were talking about the problems you have in getting big business and size mm. I'm probably asking an obvious question which you've already taken action on is, but if you go to the big business organizations like business leadership mm. and others and talk to them, would you be able to persuade, wouldn't you be able to sway them then to come on board? Yeah. Look, so a good question. Firstly, I just want to say, uh, this is not about me, so don't thank me too. This is about a team of great people, 40, 40 people there and, and growing. So uh, <clears throat> yeah, I know we will, I will certainly. Um, remind me, Paul. <laughs> yeah. Um, so business leadership SA, BUSA, we engage with them, good guys. Um, they too are underfunded. Amazing that business leadership be give, should be given that institution from that 100 top companies all the money they need to do the good work that they can and do. So we are engaging with them. Um, and it's about finding what is the right model that civil society and business can work <coughs> together. There's far greater appetite today than there was uh, a couple of years ago. Far greater. So it's, we are on the right track, but it's slow. It's painstaking. I mean, we're asking for the audit industry to get themselves together into a room, lock themselves in there for three days and come out with a solution. Because if they don't, we don't trust them. And what we want to do is lock the boards of those big companies in there with them. And we want to force the boards of those big companies to start introducing open uh, auditing to find the corruption in their books. Stop giving them these tight, you don't step out the line here, this is all we want you to audit. <coughs> and that, no, we want, the, we want all auditors now, all auditing companies. We told KPMG, here's an opportunity for you to change the game. Become that first auditing company that walks away from business if they don't sign your new charter. And your new charter should include things like, if you do business with government, you must allow us to go and value the, and look at those contracts and see what could government have got those contracts from your competitors at at a market-related prices. And if there's a 10% variance, a red flag goes up. That's the type of auditing we want. Now go and force that issue. I don't know what it is about business, but this, you know, business as usual uh, don't rock the boat attitude is, is, is worrying. It's, it's sickening, actually. Three? Three. Three. Absolutely. Three. Uh, three over there and then four. Three four. No, three was there. <coughs> I've got uh, three quick questions. Um, are you optimistic now that Sir Ramaphosa is in power? Do you think he's the right man to take this country forward? Going back to the ETOLs, now that you've branched out into other projects, mm. what was the end game? of ETOLs for outer. The system is still here, even mm. though we still have civil <coughs> disobedience, but it's still here. Mm. So was the end game to get rid of it entirely? Mm. And what further action is outer going to take on ETOLs, if anything? And then playing devil's advocate here, some would argue that South Africa is in too big of a hole to mm. get out of. Mm. Looking at the state-owned enterprises, <coughs> they're in too much of a hole mm. to get out of. Your response to, the, to mm -hmm. those people. So the ETOL endgame was to end the ETOL scheme. It was to have government reverse its decision. And it couldn't because it had borrowed the money and it, and it was sold the plan by Sanral, the architects who said, no, it will work. It will work. And literally, they believed that we, they would deal with civil disobedience by arresting a few high-profile people and everyone would come running. And this was literally their modus operandi. Do. <clears throat> so um, you say it's there. Uh, I, I, I can only liken it to the DJs playing their music, the lights are on the dance floor, but there's not a soul in sight. There's two people on the dance floor, and the DJ thinks he's got a party. And there's nothing happening. So the lights are on, the system's ticking over, the bills are going out, but no one's paying. 
and they can do nothing about it because they're three million motorists. So this is what happens when civil society brings its power and, and becomes disobedient, as they did to the past laws and things like that. It is about making the scheme ungovernable, and the government's got to make a choice. Go to war with its citizens. Go to war, meaning we're going to lock you up. We're going to sum summons you, all three million of you. Or we're going to come to our senses and realize this is not going to work. And, and it's not working. So, so Bladen Zimundi is the new Minister of Transport. We've had six in the last seven years, and he has said it's not working. So that means they've acknowledged it. So has Sir Ramaphosa, so has David Makura. That means it's dead. But they haven't pulled the plug yet because the elections are still a little bit away. So let's get closer to the elections and make a nice uh, ruling party decision here. The other thing is there's the contracts only end towards the end of the year. And, and they're still getting 60 million rand a month from business, big business, mainly big business. Even government departments don't pay e tolls. <laughs> but business does. Business does, because when government says, or Sanra says, you know, uh, Cyril or these guys have stopped paying, have a talk to them and quickly start paying again. We send a big business, stop paying, just kill it today. So they're keeping it alive, 60 million rand a month, and there's 13 contractors, I think, roughly. Catering contracts, guarding contracts, all these suppliers, and they're loving this revenue stream. And the, uh, <coughs> there was another point, or did I cover them all there? Uh, Cyril, the right man to take Yeah, Cyril, Cyril is probably one of the, uh, he's, you know, we all say, where was he? Why wasn't he ra raising these issues? He was in the thick of it. He could see what was going on. Um, I think he's the right, he is the right person. He's probably the best w chance we've got. And, uh, but you must know that he's trying to do this job with uh, a one hand tied behind his back and five fingers uh, strapped. To, it's just, it's really tough because uh, he, he got in on a ticket uh, and, and some of those people shouldn't be there. And he's got an election coming up and the political dynamics and forces that I'd play in this factionalized uh, ANC is, is it's the toughest job I imagine that anyone could have. And, and, and I think he's got a game plan. And he's done a lot of good stuff, and it feels like he's not doing enough, but he can't do enough. And he will do it when he gets into the 2019 elections. You get that behind you, and you're still in power, then he will allow the rule of law to start taking its course. And then, and then civil society's cases start coming to the fore. And then he can say, hey, I can't do any, I can't stop the courts. Sorry, Mr. Mabuza. You know, I've got to just allow the thing to happen. And then your response to the naysayers? South Africa's in too big of well, a hole. <clears throat> we are in a massive hole. We've got to go to the World Bank, maybe, to bail out a couple of institutions like Eskom and that. You know, I just cast your mind back uh, eight months before December. I can tell you, in, in, our, in our social media pages and that, I've never seen the escalation and the state of depression that this country was in. It was incredible. <clears throat> and it was a case of no hope, we're doomed, nothing we can do, um, people were leaving, um, <coughs> yeah, everything. It was, it was disheartening and, and, and people were getting angry at us because we were doing what we felt was the right thing to do but they felt we weren't doing enough. And, uh, and, and it was hard, we had to respond and say, guys, don't give up hope. You can't give up hope because when you give up hope, then we are dead. And then we are in a, in, then, then the hole is you just can't get out of it. So we're going to have to climb on each other's backs here to get out of this hole. We're going to have to help. We're going to have to, you know, get into these towns and, and, and make a difference. Um, and, and I think we're on a, we will get back onto a journey of recovery. The speed at which we would like that to have been is going to take a lot longer. But we're going to get to the uh, 6, 7, 8% growth rates in the next three years if we get this right. And then we will look back five years from now and, and we will have forgotten how bad it was. <clears throat> Somebody in the middle here. Yeah. A couple of simple questions. Um, with respect to your funding, yeah. um, what's the progress or potential of getting a Section 18A? The tax rebate because I'm a Bagwani and people like that <coughs> do it. Yeah. Why are you not you're not doing it? You double your funding almost immediately. Um, mm. That's the first question. Second question: I've not seen anything in the public domain. Who was the recipient of the bribery for the e system? 
Who did the Austrians pay? <coughs> yeah, um, we've been, we've been looking for that. That's a good question. We've been looking for the answer to that question for a long time. Uh, and it is the silver bullet that makes them have to stop tomorrow because the judge did say any corruption found, and that's the end of it. Um, so, and we've heard a lot, but they don't want to talk about it because it's hearsay, it's speculation, um, possibly. But, but we believe there was 400 million rand in, in four different tranches <coughs> paid. And, um, and, and I think that's, that's as much as we can say about, <coughs> about it. It was corruption then. It was corruption on the contracts uh, <coughs> on the roads as well. Getting, getting back to the Section 18A, Yes, I think we 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 dabbling with that now to to convert to a Section 18A public benefit organisation. There are more conditions. The other side of our board says become a business, become a PTY, and we're saying, wow, hold on. Um, the question we've got for business, and I don't believe it'll massively increase our in input because we haven't been asked the question very often because it's only big business that that matters to really. You know, if you're going to give us uh, half a million rand, you're going to want half of that back. Our question is, <clears throat> if that's the motivation for you to support civil society, I don't know if we want the money. If, if it's to get some back, um, give, us, give us the fund. <laughs> <Yeah. coughs> I understand. So we will, we, will, we will look at it. I mean, it's a question we, 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 we do contemplate. Um, and, uh, but we've got to go through the motions and, 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 and do the applications and, and become an 18A certified and you have to change the behavior slightly of your organization as well. And it, um, it's different to a non-profit company. There are more onerous conditions and, uh, and we've, got to, we, we've got to contemplate the, the, the consequences of that as well. It's not a burning issue. I think when big business starts to come on board, and we're going to go there, and this becomes a, a real issue, we'll have to do something. Norman? Yeah, Wayne, uh, what an honor and thank you for the work. <clears throat> I have a question relating to the big picture. Mm. And the big picture is, is that socialism, and this is what this government is in fact implementing, always fails. And one of the reasons it fails, there are many reasons why it fails, but one of them is, is that what economists call malinvestment. In other words, every decision that these corporations make, San Raul and Eskom, are not motivated by business principles. They are motivated by, call it, political principles. Mm. And the reason why the Soviet bloc broke up was essentially over that. They had so much malinvestment that mm. it broke the state, mm. thus ending the, the Soviet Union. Um, are you prompting government in that direction, in terms of your policy is wrong, not only on socialism, but on BEE as you now construe it, because I can understand why one would want BEE to help indigent uh, people, but I don't understand why the same people, very rich people, get benefited all the time, and that's essentially what's happening. Are you prompting government in, in those two directions? Yeah. Certainly, on, on the, the modus operandi or the role of government, it, that is coming to the fore in the questions now. So, I mean, ask yourselves why we need an, a state airline. The rest of the world's moved away from that. We don't need a flag on the tail of an aircraft <coughs> to and, and keep bailing it out because it cannot compete. It can't compete because business runs businesses efficiently in a competitive environment. And if government doesn't run SA efficiently, as they haven't, then we bail it out. Yes, <clears throat> so it becomes political. It's exactly the same thing at Eskom. You see what's happened well, after the hive of Telcom. It's become a competitive player. It's a totally different. There's private equity. It's not going to allow those decisions to be made. So we see the privatization of Eskom, a very necessary thing. So we see the role of government having to shrink. So this is the new direction we believe, and we hear Sir Ramaphosa talking about. You know, we've gone from 23 departments to or 27 to 34, whatever. You've got to shrink government, you've got to shrink the bloatedness, but they're in a difficult position. Unemployment's high. How do you send half these people home? Eskom has to send 15,000 people home through bad decision making, became an employment agency. <clears throat> and so that is the only journey they can go because the World Bank and the guys are saying in the IMF, you're at the wall and you want money, the only way we can uh, help is for you to start doing that. So 
So, I, and I think you could privatize this. I think, I think you're going to have to bail it out to somewhat, and, and, and private companies will run and run those coal-fired power stations efficiently, give them extended life, keep the jobs employed there, try and clean up the... The problem is the <coughs> government is fixated on this policy. But they've got no choice now. Well, there's no money. Is. There's no money. Yes. There's, there is no money to buy that essay. There's no money to do any of the stuff anymore. So they're going to have to turn to business principles. <coughs> yes. Thanks, Wayne. My name is David Ansara from the Center for Risk Analysis. Mm. You said that there's no money, and my question pertains to the alternative funding model for Sanrol's mm. uh, massive capital expenditure that they've <coughs> implemented over the last few years. So in the absence of ETOLs, if the plug is pulled, mm. how will they recoup their investment or, mm. and, and, and cover their debts? Because, I mean, we already have seen a, a hike in consumer taxation in VAT this year. It doesn't seem like there's much wiggle room for the finance minister in his next budget speech to in include more taxes. So how do you solve that conundrum? Yeah. So the, the solution we put to government in 2010 <coughs> was we said then, if you want to pay the 2 billion rand bond, a, a month, that's what you need for this 20 billion rand you borrowed over the next number of years with interest. We equated it to 9 cents in the fuel levy and, uh, and they would have settled uh, those bonds. Uh, no, that's the other way you do it, is you fund it through user pays principle, you tax the people. <coughs> you see, first of all, they just shouldn't have borrowed 20 billion, they should have only borrowed 9. Okay, so they've overshot the mark. So you've got this money, and by the way, PRC invests in a, in a government-bonded um, project. I mean, big question marks there. So, so we said the user pays principle that is best for this is the fuel levy. You have a fuel levy of one rand ten cents. <clears throat> you take the money, it's not ring-fenced, two roads, we know that. It was raising 24 billion rand a year at the time. And we said raise it by 2 billion rand with this 10 cent increase. And then ring fence that, or government, or treasury, as you did give Sanral uh, a 10 billion rand at that time tranche every year, give them 12 and fund that project. And then you pay it off. That's the other way of doing it. Go to the World Bank if you have to and borrow the money and give that money to them, wherever you need the funding to come from. It's a user pay scheme that has been working for many years. <clears throat> every year government pushes the fuel levy up. We said just push it up by 10 for that. Well, they pushed it up by 30 cents that year. So effectively, they've got the money. You now have paid for those roads, and, and we were going to pay again in tolls. You must understand that the e-toll budget for Gauteng was going to give Sanral from 1% of their road network, 1%, 200 kilometers, was going to give them 21% of their revenue. So what they were essentially doing was in a concentrated... Uh, a high volume space rape the Gauteng economy. <clears throat> That's what they were trying to do. And you know that tolling doesn't get switched off when the roads are paid. All these routes, long distance routes, those concessionaires, all those uh, capital expenditures paid off. We don't know how much money is supposed to be coming back. We do know that there are a few companies getting massively rich on those. And they need to be challenged as well, all three of those concessionaires. So the funding mechanism was the most diabolical, disastrous one they chose. <clears throat> it just relied on too much stuff that was going to go wrong. And we said the easiest way in the context of the South African environment was just huck that fuel levy. Today they could have taken that 10 cents off, so we would have gone from 3 Rand 15 to 3 Rand 5. Small difference. We're overtaxed in fuel. Completely overtaxed. More than half of the fuel price now is between a road accident fund and fuel levy. So Botswana gets its fuel, engine trucks go from here to Botswana and offload the fuel there and people buy their fuel on the other side of the border at 30% cheaper than us. The motorist is heavily taxed, fuel levy, uh, uh, emissions taxes, import taxes, uh, it's, it's crazy. And of course it's a lucrative middle class, people can afford cars that can be taxed heavier. We understand that. The 75 billion rand that they now get from the fuel levy, 75. In other words, it's gone up so much that you could build in cash, pay it off in one year, another 10 uh, of these uh, of these um, uh, Gauteng freeway projects. They've only got two, three other cities that need it. So the money's there, I can assure you. But yes, now we broke. <laughs> now you want to go and, okay, raise it by 10 cents. I think we'll handle that. And you'll get the money to pay PRC their money back. Um, 
but they've lost eight years. They could have literally paid it off. It was their wrong decision, and it was so sad. I've got to take one more question. Now. Sure. <coughs> um, Wayne, great seeing you again. Carbon tax, where mm. do you stand on that? Because that's become a, a hot point for business and for, yeah. for environmentalists and for a whole lot of people. Mm. And it lay in that part that you were talking about, the build. Mm. Um, so where do you see that going forward? Mm. Because there are a lot of taxes. Uh, mm. The gentleman was worrying about cash. I can see lots of new environment levies and things yeah. have been coming up in the next couple of years. So mm. I don't think the government's run out of ideas on how to raise money. Yeah. But it's just fleecing us. And yeah. carbon tax is probably the number one at this yeah. point. And secondly, you're talking <coughs> about J JSC. And I've never got this connection right between the Institute of Directors, King 3, King 4, yeah. all those uh, good things that are supposed <coughs> to happen, and the deliverables from JSC. Mm. <coughs> that mix mm. is what your financial question was about. Yeah. How does that get resolved in South Africa? Because that is the core problem. Yeah. So just quickly on carbon tax, um, and, and to come back to the question, because we are, are, are broke as a country, we are going to government this year. We're doing the research right now, and the simple analogy we are saying is your bucket is leaking, and it's leaking so badly, and you coming to us, the public, next year with another tax hike. We can't. We cannot put any more on the top. While So you can, Mr. Government, if you do this properly, if you plug all of these holes, you will have all the money you need with no tax increase to the public. You can drop that and fix this country with the efficiencies that you now have to reinstall. So, <clears throat> so that's, that's, that's the ultimate uh, uh, journey. And what we're saying is stop having this insatiable desire to find new taxes and new ways of skimming the cat, uh, skinning this cat, because it's just, it's sad, you know, sugar tax and, 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 and the mean well, plastic bag tax, it's, it's nonsense. It's absolute nonsense. It doesn't work. The intended purposes was, was not there. Uh, the sin taxes don't slow down smoking and drinking. But get those taxes from where you can. But you've got to put a stop to it. So on carbon tax, we've had a good look at it. And our view of carbon tax is thus. It's not going to change the behavior. Carbon tax was, was meant to, in the white paper when it was written back in 2007, was meant to be introduced as the world was going into uh, uh, reducing, uh, on, for climate change purposes, the emissions output. And the way you do that is to tax people if they are polluting, simple as that. So the more you use and, and, and emit in your cars, your sales vehicles, and the lights you put on, and then you're going to be penalized. Well, Eskom did that for them. Just by, the tech, the, just by the tariff increases, everybody switched to reducing energy costs. <clears throat> so a carbon tax will not change behavior. It's just a tax. It's just you might just put on the electricity part, do something else with it, because the problem with the carbon tax is, the, and, and the auditing industry won't it. It's just another line item that they can audit and they can charge another 50,000 Rand to the big corporates for, and uh, it's bulldust. So we say... It's not fit for purpose. Don't introduce it because it's just going to be an administrative nightmare and every business is going to, going to battle with that. Coming back to um, King 4 and the JSC, it's outside of our mandate. We tackle corruption, maladministration of taxpayers' money. We'd love to get involved there. Uh, you know, again, we say to business, sort yourselves out. Sort yourselves out. Get this into, into place. Um, become... Uh, Become more efficient, become more transparent, and, and tell us everything you're doing, and audit yourselves properly, and, and stop the nonsense, man. But yeah, we can't do much more. <coughs> okay. That's the second last one here, the last one. <laughs> <laughs> now, thanks for the, for the good presentation and all you're doing. I'd like to ask, what's your relationship with other civic movements? For example, I see uh, currently there's been a strike in yeah. Swami and Eden Vape against their high the tariff increases. Mm -hmm. you know? yeah. So I'm asking in terms of our because that's a question of maladministration. I mean, uh, what's your relationship with uh, other civil action? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, bef before I go into that, I forgot to put one thing on the last slide. Um, if you want to donate to Arta, <laughs> <laughs> it's easy. It takes five minutes. But you just got to go to arta.co.za. Click on become a supporter. Please uh, consider it because it helps. 
Um, why, why, what is our relationship with other civil action movements? It's, it's, it's reasonably good in that we try and work together. So Free Market Foundation, we talk Section 27, Helen Suzman Foundation. There, there's something like 450 uh, civil action movements out there, many of them single people uh, organizations doing good work. Um, when, when I came into this space, I really was confused by the fact that civil society was fragmented. I felt that if we got together, we could do a lot more together. But I'm afraid it's tougher. It's like herding cats. It's incredibly difficult because, and we've t tried to do it a couple of times. We tried to get a, a letter to the minister on the IRP, um, a process when nuclear was the f a flavor. And we said, let's get uh, WWF, Earth Life. We've got a number of organizations with us. We wanted to put a statement on, we need the RP updated with credibility, low cost. Trying to get one page letter with five organizations to agree to the wording. It took two days and they still couldn't agree. And because this one wanted uh, women and children in the third paragraph included, and it's madness. And we tried and they called Unite Against Corruption, 27 organizations to get together. We spent two days and they realized it's just impossible because we've got different mandates, different agendas, different egos, different everything. So you can't try and coordinate. You just cannot. <clears throat> there are some that we will work with and we work very well with and behind the scenes and together we might go to court and together we might share papers. But there are others that we don't. We won't, we won't, don't want to be associated with, with certain organizations because they just bring the wrong flavor to the discussion that we. Thank you very much for your time again. Ladies and gentlemen. I think that the best indication of how we enjoyed your talk was the fact that you're still here. <laughs> <laughs> um, the rest of the time. I just remind you one thing that I don't even bother driving, I don't know if you said it, but something along the lines that for evil to succeed, all that's needed is for good men to do nothing. Yep. Yeah. Well, yeah. it seems to me we've got a lot of good men doing something, and thank you very much for that. Mm -hmm. Could I just give you a gift from the Fremont Foundation? So I'd like gifts to be shared with all the staff. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, you take turns. Hey, why don't you take? It's, it's, it's reading. It's reading. It's a book quote that, that Leon and Francis wrote in 1986. Fantastic. And it's, and it's still it's, relevant. And it's still relevant. In fact, I'm trying to get them to update. It's, it's a timeless act, this Leon. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks, Leon. Thanks, Leon. Thanks, Leon. Thanks, Leon. Thanks, Leon. Thanks, Leon. Thanks, Leon.